Good evening, everybody. I'm Pat Jenny, president of the Salisbury Forum. And on behalf of the board of directors, I welcome you to this special Zoom presentation this evening. While most of our forums are in person, occasionally we present a speaker who's not able to make to the Salisbury area and address us in person. And this evening, we are really excited to have Bonnie Glazer in a return visit to the Salisbury Forum by Zoom. Bonnie last spoke to all of us at a forum in March of 2021. As you know, all of our programs are free to the public and we count on your support and are very grateful for your ongoing contributions. Last year, 280 of you contributed generously, allowing us to cover all of the costs of us bringing these special speakers to you. So thank you. And it's very easy to give. You can go to our website or to our social media posts or to the emails that we send out to you and hit the donate button and choose the most convenient way for you to give. We don't have a staff, so you can be sure that all of your contributions go to bringing, uh, to allowing us to bring all of these forums to you. Coming up on our calendar of events it, on March 8th in one month, we will have authors Andrew Hone of the Rand Corporation and Tom Shanker, who is a former New York Times correspondent. They will discuss how we can keep America safe from various threats, from the pandemics, from cybersecurity, or from climate change. And then on April 5th, Richard Haas, who is a former diplomat and the former 20 year president of the Council on Foreign Relations, will discuss his new book, which is called The Bill of Obligations, and it identifies how we as citizens can get involved in practical and nonviolent ways. Back to Bonnie Glazer. Since Bonnie was here in 2021, at the beginning of President Biden's administration, the relationship between China and the US has advanced. Bonnie characterizes it as the most consequential of our relationships with any other power. She has spent more than 30 years as an analyst of Asia Pacific geopolitics and US policy. Bonnie Glazer is the managing director of the German Marshall Fund's Indo-Pacific program. Her latest book was published last year and is called US-Taiwan Relations, Will China's Challenge Lead to a Crisis? Before her position at the fund, Bonnie was senior, senior advisor for Asia and the director of the China Power Project, which she started at the Center for Strategic and, and International Studies. Earlier in her career, she served as a consultant for various federal agencies, including the Departments of Defense and State. Bonnie is frequently quoted on China affairs in the media, especially the New York Times or the Wall Street Journal, and she publishes in many outlets. Bonnie received her bachelor's in political science from Boston University and her master's with concentrations in international economics and Chinese studies from the Johns Hopkins School of Advanced International Studies. Now, one housekeeping note before we get started, please put any questions that come to your mind as Bonnie is speaking in the Q&A section, which is found below your screen, right in the center, it's marked Q&A. And I will be reading these to Bonnie when she finishes her remarks. So without further ado, I am going to bring you Bonnie Glazer. Hello, thank you for having me. Well, I hope you can um, share your screen, um, uh, Pat, so that we can get my slides up. Um, it has been uh, almost three years since I uh, talked to uh, the Salisbury Forum about U.S.-China relations, and it really is remarkable um, how much has changed since then. And so I'm going to talk about what has changed and uh, what the, uh, the drivers are uh, of that change. So if you go to the first slide, please, the one after the title slide, um, 
We have a picture here of President Joe Biden and China's leader, Xi Jinping. Uh, they met at the Filoli Estate in Woodside, uh, California. And that took place last uh, November. Uh, the presidents uh, previously had met um, almost exactly one year earlier in Bali, Indonesia. And that was on the margins of the G20 uh, meeting at the time. The occasion for this meeting, uh, the United States was hosting the Asia Pacific Economic Conference, APEC. And uh, Xi Jinping agreed uh, to attend, which usually China's top leader doesn't attend APEC uh, conferences annually. It's usually their uh, China's uh, premier that attends. But Xi Jinping uh, decided that he did want to attend the, sum the, uh, the APEC summit and have a separate summit with, uh, with uh, President Biden. Um, so my first question I'm really going to answer is how did we get here? Uh, where these two leaders are are meeting um, and trying to uh, stabilize the U.S.-China relationship, uh, trying to have a very frank exchange of views about their concerns, uh, about each other's policies, talk about the challenges in the world, regional flashpoints, um, wars that were taking place, and of course, um, at in November. Uh, the war in uh, Gaza had broken out, and of course, the war in Ukraine uh, still going on. So uh, two wars. Um, and also talk about maybe areas that are challenges for uh, the United States and China uh, that are global challenges where they might be able to work together. So they had quite a bit on their uh, agenda, and they spent uh, most of, of one day. Uh, in meetings. Uh, so, so how did we get here? Well, for the first two years of the Biden administration, the Chinese rejected uh, the Biden administration's framing uh, of the relationship as predominantly competitive. Uh, but this is what the Biden administration decided very early on, and it issued its first national security strategy and described China as the country with the only the only country in the world with both the ambition and the capability uh, to revise the international order in ways that might be unfavorable to the United States and to its allies and to democracy. And in the Trump administration, uh, China and Russia and global power, uh, uh, sorry, great power competition had been identified as the main challenges of uh, that the United States faced, which then was a shift, of course, away from when the United States saw terrorism as the major threat. And that, of course, was in the Middle East. So the Trump administration recentered America's focus on the, uh, the great powers, which they called China and Russia. And the Biden administration really focused on China as the main competitor. And uh, so the, the, the Chinese did not like the fact that the relationship was framed as one of primarily strategic competition. They did not like the idea that the United States um, called for putting in place guardrails um, and taking other steps to manage the competition and prevent conflict. Uh, Beijing really wanted the United States to remove the tariffs that President Trump had imposed and wanted the Obama administration to change the assessment that China was now a strategic competitor and to return to the Obama era of cooperation. And there were, of course, many people who came into the Biden administration who had served in the Obama administration. So this didn't seem far-fetched uh, to Beijing. Uh, they thought if they stood firm that uh, the United States might agree to attach a new label that was more positive, uh, maybe aspirational, but more positive, that emphasized uh, that the United States and China could work together, that they shared some interests 
and that they should uh, cooperate. Now, against this background, um, uh, Xi Jinping, who of course came to power very uh, towards the end of 2012, he became general secretary of China's Communist Party. And by uh, he, uh, when these leaders met uh, at the end of last year in 2023, uh, Xi Jinping had already uh, begun his third term in office, and that was unprecedented. Uh, Chinese leaders had not stayed in power for more than two years, but Xi Jinping had removed uh, these, these norms and the term limits on, uh, on the top leader in China. Um, I believe Xi Jinping thought and thought and still does think that he really is the only person who can help China to achieve its most important goal of uh, attaining national rejuvenation. Um, and he has set a target date for attaining national rejuvenation by 2049. Now, he probably won't be in power then, um, at least by actuarial tables. Um, of course, it could be ex exceptional, but he will be 96 years old um, in 2049. Uh, we don't know whether he will stay in power for the rest of his life, uh, but he is now, of course, in his third five-year term. And Xi Jinping appears to be quite confident that China is on a path to uh, becoming stronger than the United States. Now, it is true that China has encountered some economic um, headwinds, and uh, one could posit that maybe uh, Xi Jinping's confidence has dipped a little bit during this period. But I believe that his long run assessment has remained the same, that China is rising and the West is declining. And he believes that democracy has failed around the world, um, especially in the United States, but not only in the United States. And Xi Jinping believed uh, that China's lockdowns because of COVID were the right strategy to handle the COVID ep epidemic. You know, he did quite well for the first two years of the epidemic. It really wasn't until um, the the um, COVID strain uh, that spread to China just became impossible to contain. Um, and then, of course, he ended those lockdowns very suddenly. Um, and he has paid a, a price for that. For people uh, today, this is sort of just a side anecdote, um, but it's important, at least I think, that when people I know who are going to China today, you know, before the pandemic, uh, when people went to China, uh, they found that um, uh, officials or scholars, people that they met, uh, businessmen, were very reluctant to, to criticize Xi Jinping. Um, they were quite afraid of potential consequences. And uh, since Xi Jinping ripped off the Band-Aid of uh, the lockdowns, uh, there has been quite a bit of, of, of criticism of Xi Jinping, uh, not just, of course, for the COVID lockdowns, but for his handling of the economy and also for his foreign policy. And this is sort of a new phenomenon that has uh, emerged. But nonetheless, um, Xi Jinping is a very strong leader. Uh, there really is no opposition to his rule. Uh, Xi Jinping... Um, I think was quite confident that the Chinese economy would come roaring back and China would be able to compete with the United States and other advanced countries in high technology. Um, but now I think, as I said, um, he it, at least recognizes that China has has hit some bumps in the road uh, and there is a, uh, a slowdown in the Chinese economy and a big debate among uh, China experts and economists as to what rate China's economy is really growing at um, and what the prospects are for the Chinese economy in the future. So in this um, period, in the first two years of the Biden administration, meetings between high level American and Chinese officials uh, were quite contentious. Um, the two governments ex exchanged lists of demands uh, of each other. Um, they exchanged uh, talking points when they sat down across from each other. There was really very little in-depth conversation. 
And then, of course, Russia's invasion of Ukraine in February 2022 um, further uh, increased tensions between uh, the two countries. Mm -hmm. The United States warned Xi Jinping not to provide lethal aid uh, to Moscow. Um, if you can go back for, to the first slide, that would be great, but I'll just keep talking. <laughs> Um, you might be able to just go, yeah, there we go. Okay. Um, so just before the war broke out, Xi Jinping and Putin signed a lengthy communique in which they declared that their relationship had no limits, um, which really captured the attention of policymakers in Europe, as well as in the United States, uh, about the, the real a tightening of the of the Russia China relationship and the importance of the personal relationship between Xi Jinping and Putin the bilateral relationship between the United States and China deteriorated further in mid 2022 so just a few months after Russia's invasion of Ukraine our uh, then speaker of the house uh, Nancy Pelosi visited Taiwan um, there were major PLA exercises. The Chinese were quite angry. The U.S. had not sent uh, a, uh, a uh, Speaker of the House for about uh, 25 years to Taiwan. Um, and of course, uh, because Nancy Pelosi was from the same party as Joe Biden, they thought that Joe Biden should and could discourage her from going to Taiwan. But President Biden refused to intervene. He felt it was imperative. As somebody who spent most of his career in the Senate, he did not want to tell anybody from Congress where they could travel and where they could not travel. Um, so uh, China was quite concerned, didn't know what else the US would do to support Taiwan. And because there has been a president in Taiwan since um, 2016, who belongs to the Democratic Progressive Party, which has supported uh, independence in the past and uh, does not adopt the language to describe Taiwan as part of China, which the opposition party, the Chinese Nationalist Party, which is on Taiwan. Um, so uh, this, uh, so the Chinese don't trust uh, this leader of Taiwan, she will be in power until May 20th, as she's wrapping up the end of her second term. But in mid-2022, the Chinese were angry and they, they uh, exploited the opportunity of Pelosi's visit uh, to Taiwan to change the status quo in the Taiwan Strait. Uh, and since then, on uh, really virtually a daily basis, there have been different kinds of aircraft, uh, fighters and bombers, drones, that had been flying around Taiwan, not inside its territorial airspace, but in its air defense uh, identification zone. Um, and one of the consequences of this uh, in Beijing's policies toward the United States was that it froze US-China military engagements. Um, so then in October of uh, 2022, the US announced the biggest shift ever in American policy toward uh, technology sold to China. The US issued a sweeping set of export controls uh, aimed at restraining China's military modernization efforts by controlling advanced AI chips made with US imports. So any US made technology in any chip could no longer be uh, sold to China. So any kind of design capability um, and the US, although we don't manufacture uh, chips, we have not had fabs in the United States, but still the US has a lead in the design of chips. And so this is, it was essentially an effort, continues today, of course, to try to cut off China's ability to catch up with the United States and the few other places in the world that um, uh, are involved in, uh, in producing uh, very advanced chips. And this includes, of course, um, Taiwan Semiconductor Manufacturing Corporation in Taiwan. So after, after these export controls were announced, any 
American or foreign company would be barred from selling products to China that contain any US technology in advanced semiconductor chip design. And bilateral relations really hit a new low at that point. So then um, the November Bali meeting, which I mentioned before. So in 2022, November, uh, Joe Biden, China's leader Xi Jinping held their first in-person talks since 2017. So they were again in Bali, Indonesia, on the sidelines of the G20 summit, and they met for three and a half hours there. Both leaders had a good conversation. Um, they defended their really vital interests, uh, but they they did ap apparently want to put a floor under the relationship. And Chinese officials in advance of the summit communicated this to U.S. officials that they felt it stabilizing the U.S.-China relationship was important and they did not want to see further deterioration. So Biden provided interesting um, reassurances uh, to Xi Jinping. He reaffirmed that a stable and prosperous China is good for the United States and good for the world. In other words, the United States really doesn't benefit from a weak China. Um, we want to see China succeed. Um, he said the United States respects China's system and does not seek to change it. Uh, you may remember that uh, there are our former Secretary of State under uh, President Donald Trump uh, basically supported a policy of trying to overthrow the Chinese Communist Party. So this was a reassurance uh, to Xi Jinping. He said the United States does not seek a new Cold War, does not seek to revitalize alliances against China. It does not support Taiwan independence. It does not support two Chinas or one China, one Taiwan, and it has no intention of having a conflict with China. And then finally, he said the U.S. has no intention to seek decoupling from China, to halt China's development or to contain um, China's rise. So this is a very clear set of reassurances that uh, President Biden provided uh, to Xi Jinping. So that summit was supposed to be followed by a visit to China by Secretary of State Blinken. And that trip was planned for February, 2023. But that visit was derailed. And I'm guessing that most of you who are listening to my talk know why. We had a gigantic spy balloon um, that likely was blown off course. Um, it probably was not intended to fly over the United States, uh, but it did. And it ended up flying over sensitive military installations, um, particularly in Montana. And we actually had, of course, a U.S. citizen look up at the sky. This was a really massive size balloon and saw it, took pictures of it, gave it to the media. And then the administration realized, bad idea to try to keep this under wraps. Um, and in the briefing that was given to President Biden, he decided from the very beginning that he had to shoot this thing down. I think he didn't want to be seen as weak. Um, he is sensitive to the um, Republicans in Congress who are often criticizing him for being weak on China. And it was interesting that Beijing's um, public statement right after this, within 24 hours of the U.S. making public that this balloon was flying over the United States, um, they, they issued a public statement and the Chinese said that they regretted the incident. And that was essentially ignored uh, by the United States. Um, and so this episode to me um, really demonstrated, and I think to China, the impact of domestic politics on the U.S.-China relationship. The Chinese were appalled that the United States just could not defuse this crisis. We found out later that the spy balloon didn't take any pictures when it went over the United States. Uh, we don't know if that's because it was not working right, or maybe the United States disabled its cameras. Um, it did have some signals intelligence capability, but our uh, our intelligence community has said, no, this did not um, actually take any, uh, it was not used to uh, to get any 
any sensitive information while it was flying over the United States. And as soon as it left the East Coast, the, uh, the United States uh, shot it down. So it took several months before both countries were able to re-engage. Uh, Blinken went to China in June, finally rescheduling his trip. Other cabinet secretaries followed. Uh, Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen went, our Commerce Secretary Gina Raimondo went to China, and working groups were established to address specific issues and to explain the intentions behind each other's policies. Then, of course, everybody knew the U.S. was going to host this APEC summit, and that this provided an opportunity for the two presidents to meet and to try again to stabilize the relationship. And both sides had incentives to do so, but for different reasons. For the United States, the U.S. was about to enter an election year in which China was likely to be a political football. Um, there won't be a presidential summit uh, in 2024, and other channels needed to be relied on to manage the relationship. I think the U.S. worried about lack of engagement, lack of any kind of conversations between U.S. and Chinese officials. Uh, this had led to growing risk of misperceptions, risk of accidental conflict, um, especially due to the frozen ties between the two militaries. And our allies were concerned that the bilateral relationship had become too competitive and could result in an accidental conflict. And they wanted the United States and China to tamp down the tensions between them. The drivers for the Chinese were different. I think, going back to something I said earlier, that the drivers for China are primarily about uh, related to concerns about the economy and social stability. Um, Evergrande, uh, the company um, in China that uh, owns so much of the real estate, defaulted on its debt in 2021. It sparked a property crisis in China's economy that still has not been resolved today. Foreign investment began to decline uh, going into, into China in 2022. And in fact, in the third quarter of 2023, just before the presidents met in California, foreign investment turned negative for the first time on record, which is a really alarmist uh, data point in my view. Then there's youth unemployment. China's National Bureau of Statistics stopped announcing the, job, the jobless rate for uh, 16 to 24 year olds after the figure climbed for six consecutive months to 21.3% in June of 2023. And then of course, there's been a stock market sell-off um, to date, that has wiped out um, almost, I think, $3 trillion in value. Um, and China's GDP growth um, was officially 5.2% last year, one of the weakest performances in, dec in decades, by the way. But most Western economists think that growth was likely half that number. Um, the IMF now forecasts slowing growth for the next um, few years and in 2028 forecasts, it will be 3.5%. So basically, I think China needs a more favorable and more stable external environment. And um, a, a final reason is that Beijing wanted to um, attempt to give the United States incentives to slow or maybe even reverse the restrictions on technology uh, going to China, what I talked about earlier, the semiconductor uh, restrictions. Um, and they were concerned about uh, growing uh, restrictions on people-to-people -people exchanges, including, including research institutions, um, which really enable some of China's innovation. So we're going to go to the next slide and talk about uh, areas of potential progress in the relationship coming out of the meetings between the two presidents. So first of all is fentanyl. All of you know um, uh, what the United States is going through uh, with fentanyl. Um, uh, the number of deaths um, has been um, uh, truly, uh, it, they have been mounting um, and it has been incredibly tragic, the, the number of people who have died from this drug. And the Trump administration uh, had tried uh, to get the Chinese to uh, cooperate. Uh, China banned the manufacture of four types of fentanyl in 2017 and later expanded the list to 25 types. 
Um, the Trump administration wanted an even wider ban um, to slow the flow of fentanyl from China into the United States. And they achieved that goal in 2019 when the Chinese agreed to add fentanyl related substances to their list of controlled drugs. And for a while, the flow of fentanyl from China to the US slowed a bit, but the volume then quickly picked up again and it became uh, apparent that China wasn't pressing the, the drug into pills and sending it straight to the United States, but instead was sending these precursor chemicals, um, especially to Mexico. And uh, fentanyl and other addictive opioid drugs uh, really began to flood into Mexico and these drug cartels in Mexico then uh, were sending them, uh, shipping them to the United States. So this is a really major domestic issue and a political vulnerability for Biden as he um, is in, in the, of course, uh, the, the presidential campaign. And um, so it was really an effort. Uh, somebody had to go directly to Xi Jinping to explain to him why it was in China's interest to help uh, the United States and President Biden. And that person turned out to be Senator Schumer. Um, he went to China. It was the first congressional delegation to China since before COVID. And it, by the way, the only one. We still haven't had any more go. Uh, but um, he sat down with Xi Jinping um, and the other members of Congress on his delegation. And he went into some lengthy uh, exp explanation to Xi Jinping about why this is important for China to cooperate. And the Chinese started taking action against Chinese synthetic drug and chemical precur precur precursor supplies. Almost immediately, um, companies were shut down, international payment accounts were, blocks, were blocked, and this marked the first law enforcement action against synthetic drug-related chemical sellers by Chinese authorities since 2017. So it's really seen as a big win um, for the United States. Um, in addition, um, uh, there's the, the Chinese took more um, more actions. Uh, in, uh, uh, they submitted 145 incidents to the International Narcotics Control Board global, global database, which provides real time information uh, for for countries about things like uh, shipments that are suspected of trafficking. So the Chinese are not only doing this bilaterally, they're also really doing it multilaterally. And um, January 30th, uh, the two countries uh, launched a new joint working group on fentanyl uh, precursor chemicals. So this is the first area where the US and China are beginning to cooperate. The second area um, uh, where we've seen some progress is in the defense relationship. Um, when Xi Jinping met with Biden, uh, he did agree to lift the restrictions uh, on uh, the mi military to military uh, relations that had been imposed after Nancy Pelosi's visit. And so the uh, defense policy consultative talks between, uh, this is at the level of uh, Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense in our Pentagon and a counterpart in China. Um, those talks were actually just held about three weeks ago. Um, our uh, safety talks on air and uh, safety at safety in the air and at sea. Um, these take place in Hawaii. They're called the Military Maritime Consultative um, Agreement talks. Those are going to resume in April. Um, and uh, they've resumed their uh, uh, the practice of notifying each other of major military exercises. They've agreed to establish a hotline between theater commanders and our Secretary of Defense is going to meet with China's Defense Minister at the Shangri-La Dialogue um, this coming uh, June. So um, it's still early days. I'm personally not extremely optimistic about the military relationship achieving very much. Um, China's military is very suspicious of uh, the United States. Uh, they don't really want to engage in risk reduction with the United States. Uh, because they think it legitimizes and justifies the uh, United States military presence very close to China's coastline and its borders. So uh, 
they don't uh, really want to um, allow the United States to safely operate um, all of our intelligence and other operation, our, our equipment, all our platforms all around China. And then the, the third area um, is artificial intelligence. And this is brand new. I mean, this is a completely new issue anyway. There's no rules uh, internationally. There's no regulations or norms. And the U.S. is really concerned about potential military risks. Um, AI capabilities are already embedded um, in both countries' military systems. There's autopilot, of course, in our aircraft. There's computer vision and targeting uh, systems. There's pattern recognition in intelligence analysis. These are just some examples. Uh, the challenge is not to um, prevent the military application of artificial intelligence. Um, that is unachievable. But instead, the goal is to begin building boundaries and common expectations around acceptable military uses of automation. And um, I've talked to officials, for example, who want to agree with China that we will keep humans in the loop in decision making on potential launch of nuclear weapons. We just don't want to leave that to artificial intelligence systems. That's really dangerous. So that's an example of something that the U.S. and China will be talking about uh, together. Um, and they have launched a track one. There was track one means just officials. There used to be um, a 1.5, which meant that experts were also included. So they're elevating to a higher level uh, the conversations about artificial intelligence. So next slide, um, I'm going to talk about areas of convergence and competition. And I'll try to go through this fairly quickly. Um, the first uh, slide you see on the left is Xi Jinping talking to Vladimir Putin. Um, this is clearly an area of concern that the United States has um, from the U.S. point of view, from the point of view of our allies, especially in Europe. Uh, Russia poses a major threat. Its invasion of Ukraine um, is a major threat to uh, international law and to Europe. Uh, and the United States continues, of course, to support Ukraine. There was um, some progress toward uh, make toward the vote today to continuing to um, uh, to provide uh, funding um, for for Ukraine. Um, and when Xi Jinping um, and and Putin met last year, uh, it was really clear they share a very similar worldview. Um, Xi Jinping told Putin there are changes taking place that are unseen in a century, the first time in a hundred years, uh, a phrase he likes to use a lot. And he said, we are driving them together. Um, the Russians and the Chinese have strengthened cooperation in many fields, uh, defense, uh, military intelligence, cyber, disinformation, uh, science and technology. This is not a marriage of convenience, which is a phrase that people used to use. Um, so the United States is has told China there would be severe consequences if they provide lethal aid uh, to Russia to use in the war in Ukraine, and the Chinese have not um, done so. That said, they have done virtually nothing to try and bring an end to the war uh, in Ukraine. Um, the picture there, of course, to the to the um, right is of uh, Ukraine and surrounding uh, countries, and to the right of that um, is a picture of the Middle East. And um, since October 7th, the Hamas terrorist attack on Israel and the uh, subsequent Israeli strikes on Gaza, uh, China has positioned itself um, as an advocate for peace, uh, calling for an immediate ceasefire in Gaza and the establishment of an independent uh, Palestinian state. It has severely criticized the United States for supporting Israel. Uh, China used to have a fairly good relationship with Israel, um, including in the technological realm. But um, they, uh, they threw Israel under the bus. Uh, and what is really remarkable to me is how much anti-Semitic propaganda there is now um, in China. Uh, but the Chinese just turned 180 degrees uh, against Israel. Official Chinese statements and media have never mentioned Hamas's attacks on Israel. It, they've never even mentioned the hostages. 
And so Beijing has really actively attempted to use this conflict to denigrate, to discredit the United States, and to win support in the developing world or the, what people often refer to today as the global South. And it has used this conflict to try to drive a wedge between the United States and Europe. Um, the Biden administration has, has consistently and repeatedly urged Beijing to use its influence with Iran um, uh, to get Tehran to stop um, exacerbating regional instability, including by uh, its, its support for the Houthis and the attacks on civilian ships in the Red Sea. Um, China has leverage over Iran. It's one of Iran's largest trading partners. It buys a large quantity of oil, but we have seen uh, basically nothing um, out of uh, China. Uh, I do not believe that if they have raised this at all with Iran, that they have done so in a way that they have threatened consequences. Um, a few words about North Korea. Um, and uh, that um, picture, of course, is um, the last one on the right, on the on the top uh, uh, level, the, the top row. Uh, Tensions on the Korean Peninsula are at their highest point in years. Uh, Kim Jong-un has accelerated his ways weapons development while pursuing provocative uh, threats um, and issuing provocative threats uh, against the United States, South Korea, and Japan. And so the US, of course, has strengthened our relations with our Asian allies. And uh, the United States wants Beijing to use its leverage uh, really for two purposes uh, over North Korea, to stop Kim from using force to create a crisis. Many people believe that this is the year that Kim Jong-un is going to use kinetic force in some way against South Korea, not necessarily a full-scale invasion, but something like the sinking of the Chonan um, uh, mini submarine a few years ago, or the shelling of the island of Yongpyeondo. Um, and the other reason, the other um, uh, uh, reason that uh, objective that the United States would like Beijing uh, to do is to warn Kim Jong Un against providing Russia with weapons, um, uh, which they've been doing uh, a lot of ammunition that Russia is using on the battlefield. And so far, China hasn't responded to any of these entreaties. So you know, here we're looking at um, three major regional flashpoints where there could be some overlap in US and Chinese interests. There could be the potential for our countries to work together, but the Chinese are not, and that is worrisome. Bottom left, you see uh, a map of Taiwan, and this is the most dangerous flashpoint in the relationship. It is the only issue that could result in a large scale military conflict between the US and China. Taiwan is, it's the major focus of all meetings between U.S. and Chinese uh, officials, including our presidents, um, and it was when they met in uh, Woodside, California. Um, and while Beijing and Washington disagree about the best way to preserve peace and stability in the Taiwan Strait, I believe neither seeks a military conflict. Um, the Chinese uh, policy of, uh, of increasing their military capability Against, um, against Taiwan is worrisome uh, to the United States. And the United States is trying to strengthen um, deterrence to prevent this conflict from taking place. Um, and uh, I did write co-author a book earlier this year um, on this issue. Um, and uh, we've just had a very important election in Taiwan last month. Uh, the Vice president um, uh, has become, a, he, he has been elected president. Uh, his name is William Lai. Um, he only won 40% of the votes, but there were two other challengers. Um, and I actually think the result is somewhat reassuring to China because they can tell their public 60% of Taiwan's voters did not vote for this, uh, this uh, candidate who they uh, claim is, is pro in independence. Uh, so we have seen a few reactions from China. I can talk about that more in the Q&A if you're interested. But the next real seminal moment will be the presidential inauguration on May 20th. Um, the United States is warning China against um, continuing to pressure Taiwan, but it is also trying to restrain 
this new president-elect in Taiwan from taking provocative actions. Um, so it's a very proactive set of policies, but there is nothing we disagree more um, with uh, China on than Taiwan, except that I think neither leader really wants uh, a conflict. Um, moving on uh, for a few words about nuclear weapons, um, you may have read that China's approach to nuclear weapons has undergone a major transformation. Uh, for decades, China's nuclear doctrine was based on uh, essentially that they needed to have effective and survivable uh, nuclear arsenal. They wanted to have a high level of confidence that if the United States attacked them first, that they would be able to deliver um, a, uh, a retaliatory strike that the United States would find unacceptable, and that would therefore deter the United States from ever launching that first strike uh, against uh, China. So our Pentagon today uh, estimates China now has uh, more than 500 operational nuclear warheads. That's probably double than they had just two years ago. Um, China's developing a launch on warning capability. It does appear to want to match the size of the U.S. nuclear arsenal. Um, and so this is very, very worrisome. The forecast now is that China will have 1,500 nuclear warheads by 2035. Um, and so this is a, a major area of, uh, of divergence. And then the very last one, um, which... Um, is probably obvious to everyone, and I talked a bit about earlier when I talked about semiconductors, um, is advanced technology. Technology is the main arena of US-China competition. Um, it really may be decisive in determining which country emerges as the more powerful one in the coming decades. And China wants to dominate um, these really key areas of, of technology and the uh, strategic technology in the 21st century. Um, they essentially believe that we're in this fourth industrial revolution that will drive technological innovation of AI and biotech and quantum computing and smart manufacturing, and that this will provide China with the means to eventually overtake um, the West. Um, and they know that technological dominance is linked to financial power, to supply chains, to information flows. Um, and so they want to use this capability um, going forward. Um, and, and so uh, this is really an area where there's a great deal of tension between the United States and China. The U.S. says we're pursuing a small garden, high fence strategy. But um, most people tell me uh, that's probably not a really good description because technology changes very, very rapidly, and therefore the size of the garden will likely change um, as well. Um, and the Chinese complain bitterly at very high levels about the uh, US technology restrictions. Um, so we'll go to the last slide, which I think is just my questions. Um, and I look forward uh, to discussion and anything else you would like me to elaborate on. Thank you very much, Bonnie. That was really a terrific and full presentation uh, about issues going on between with, with China. And uh, I certainly have learned a lot. We do have some questions posted, um, but to the audience, if you have any others, please continue to put them into Q&A. Um, and we will be able to... Um, learn more from Bonnie this evening. So one question is, could you comment on China's relationship with Latin America and Africa and how the US is uh, involved in any of that development of those relationships? It, that it's, it's an important question. It's a very broad one, um, but yeah. it I did touch on this sort of very briefly when I talked about China's efforts to really win over the developing world. And, you know, China's been engaged in Africa for a very, very long time. Uh, it conducts these annual uh, big summits that they invite all of the leaders of, of Africa to. Their Belt and Road uh, program, which has been in place since 2013, has provided a great deal of loans 
uh, to African countries to build infrastructure. Um, and there, this has been a mixed bag. Some of it has been a success, some of it has not. Uh, but China increasingly, I think, prioritizes its relations with the global South. And it's important to them in the United Nations when there's a vote that all of these countries vote with China. Um, if there's anything that relates to Taiwan, any of these countries will just say, yeah, we support whatever Beijing wants. Um, and the United States, I think, struggles to compete very effectively with China. Um, I personally think that the United States hasn't come up with a really good way to compete with China, although we're now thinking more about it. We're trying to work alongside Europe uh, to offer um, alternatives to developing countries uh, by uh, providing different kinds of our own assistance, although we generally don't do infrastructure building, but we, of course, provide aid in other ways. And so it's higher on the U.S. list of priorities, but I'm not convinced that we've made much headway. Um, and you may know that the reputation of the United States in many of these countries is not very positive. Um, even in countries where they're disappointed with China's performance, um, they don't necessarily like the United States. Um, so this is where we really need to rely actually more on our allies. Japan, for example, um, has a pretty good reputation in Southeast Asia, in Africa. Um, it, its um, aid programs are really effective. Um, and uh, working alongside uh, with Australia in the Pacific Islands uh, is really important. And so I think that aspect of the Biden administration is a better way to go. Great. Um, here's another question about how is China's trade affected by the problems with the Houthis at the at the Suez Canal and what are they doing about it, if anything? Well, I think uh, the 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 question uh, goes goes right at the heart of what I believe is is China's approach. If it were damaging China's interests, they would do something about it. But they're not. <laughs> I don't think that China shipping um, has been attacked. Uh, if if there were instances where we had Chinese ships that were attacked, I I think that the Chinese probably um, would uh, would become more involved. Um, we have seen um, one thing that happened um, a couple of days ago. The Chinese Navy started escorting Chinese cargo ships through the Red Sea. Um, they've not joined the US-led coalition to protect shipping, but they are escorting. So they're more nervous that their ships might be attacked. Um, but to me, this is, it's a very self-interested response. They do want to prevent their own shipping from being attacked. But so far, I, I think this is one of the reasons why they haven't put any pressure on Iran, because um, they haven't suffered any losses. Right, right. So here's one from John O'Brien. How will China's rapid population decline and aging of the population affect the country's ability to, to achieve its long-term strategic and economic goals? There's been some really interesting work that have been done, that's been done by demogra demographers. I think, um, that some people believe that China's uh, demographic challenges will be very, very consequential going forward. And I don't have the numbers in front of me, but we are talking about a really serious decline in uh, in the Chinese population and and the and the working um, uh, age, you know, population. Uh, I, it's it has already kicked in earlier than I think the Chinese government and demographers had predicted. Uh, that said, uh, I think that the Chinese government has tried to take measures uh, to, uh, to try and, and, and limit the really negative impact. And it's one of the reasons, of course, where, why they are uh, using automation um, a great deal more in their, in their factories. But I think the jury's still out as to whether or not um, that one factor is going to be the most problematic for them. Uh, you know, like three years ago, when you know China was still 
under COVID. And we were all thinking when China came out of COVID, its economy was going to boom. Um, everybody was paying attention to the demographic factor. And now there's so many other economic problems that I hear a little bit less about it because there's really immediate um, problems that the Chinese uh, are, are facing. So I think demography is, is a bit of a more sort of medium and longer term challenge. And the Chinese do have some time to try to deal with it. Uh, but they're not going to be able to increase, I think, um, the uh, the size of their population. There are no incentives that are going to encourage women to have more children. Fewer women are getting married. Um, it's so expensive to have a child. Um, uh, and, and people have had one child for so long that when they lifted the uh, the restrictions and said, you can have more children and we encourage you to have more children. People are like, oh, it's our culture now, our practice. It's everybody just has one child and pour tens of thousands of dollars, you know, into educating the child. Uh, and, and people think, oh, if I multiply that times two or three, no way, can't afford it. Um, so changing the culture, I think, is just going to be really, really difficult. And to be fair, Every advanced economy um, has had a slowdown in, in the population, but some countries rely more on immigration than others. And it's my view, this is one of the strengths of the United States, um, not um, unrestricted immigration, but um, some of the smartest people um, that I know um, uh, are, are uh, come from families who uh, immigrated uh, from other countries. And, and many of them have been from China. So the Chinese, I don't think they're gonna adopt a policy of allowing more immigration. Right, right. Well, here are a couple of questions about the relationship between China and the US. What are the greatest sources of soft power that could help bridge ties between the two countries, China and the US? Not sure I understand the question um, because I tend to think of soft power as something that um, the United States has soft power, the Chinese have some soft power, they're trying to accelerate their soft power. They, they recognize that you can't be a great power unless other countries see you as a great power. Not because they're afraid of you, just because you have a big military or because they you want they, they want to trade with you, but be, you, you have something attractive about your system. And Xi Jinping has recently lost this launched the civilization initiative to show the world, you know, Chinese civilization is superior to any other. So I tend to think of soft power as something that divides the United States and China rather than as something that brings us together because we, we everything is framed in very competitive terms, including soft power. Yeah, yeah. Uh, here's another one. Uh, uh, with a decreasing number of Americans learning Mandarin Chinese, is there a US policy that could uh, provide a course correction to that trend? Presumably more, more Americans starting to learn Mandarin again. I, I really agree with the fact that this is a, a big problem. Um, we had a surge in interest in studying Chinese in the United States. And uh, part of the problem is not our policies. Um, part of it is that if you're going to study Chinese, you want to be able to go to China um, to learn the language. <laughs> And um, if you go on the State Department website, you will find that Americans are, are told uh, to be cautious, not to not go, but to be cautious. You know, there's different levels of caution. Um, and, uh, you know, which foreigners are, are followed, they're surveilled, um, uh, and you don't have those sort of freedoms uh, that you could, you could, you could get in trouble um, even sort of uh, without um, deliberately looking for trouble. And there are very few uh, joint uh, university programs that are left to attend. Most of those have ended. Um, and the United States has essentially uh, 
pr pursued policies that have resulted in almost every university shutting down the Confucius Institutes. Um, so the only thing the U.S. has done to try and, and fill in that gap is to encourage Taiwan to open up uh, some centers of language training. And um, that's useful, uh, but it's not going to be sufficient to replace what really has been shut down. But part of the problem is not just providing the language training centers, but also providing um, uh, uh, students with uh, in encouragement to study the language, um, the, the, it, the positive incentives. Um, they have to feel that they could get a job, they could actually learn the language, um, and it's very hard to do that if you're just in the United States. I mean, I started my language study in the United States um, and then went uh, and lived in Taiwan for a year and a half. But that was 1979, and there really were very few language programs in mainland China. Um, so I, I, you know, everybody from sort of the mid 80s onward really went to China. And nowadays, very, very few we have 350 students studying in China today. Big drop. Uh, another question. Can the uh, Association of Southeast Asian Nations maintain political neutrality and still secure growth in trade with and, and ongoing investment with China? Um, you know, ASEAN, of course, is a is composed of 10 Southeast Asian nations that all have their own different relationships with China. Um, even though, of course, they have uh, some joint agreements, they have their own policies. Uh, they have, of course, their own economic policies. Right now, the country that has the worst relations with China is the Philippines. Um, and probably the country that has the best relations with China is maybe Laos. Um, it's, it's a broad spectrum. And I, I think that uh, the one thing they really have in common is that they don't want to be, well, maybe Laos is already chosen. It's almost like a satellite of China and, and Cambodia maybe a, a, as well. But for the other countries, and particularly the maritime countries, they don't want to be forced to choose between the United States and China. They tell the United States that all the time, do not force us to choose. And so they want to remain um, really neutral. Um, and it, it will be difficult for them to do so if China uses force in the South China Sea and starts seizing uh, some of the land features that belong to other countries, um, that whether it's the Philippines or Malaysia um, or, um, or Vietnam, uh, this will make it, I think, very difficult for, for countries to really maintain their neutrality. Uh, but that has not happened yet, that we are getting closer. Um, uh, I think um, the, the, the Chinese have used a lot of different kinds of um, military, well, it's sort of the, the um, below the threshold that would trigger a military response from the United States, where they have been... Um, using uh, water cannons against uh, Philippine fishing boats and even ramming them with their Coast Guard vessels. But we have not yet seen any use of Navy vessels um, by, uh, by China against the Philippines. But there could be an accident or the Chinese could decide that they've been patient long enough and they could just decide to go seize uh, Second Thomas Shoal, which is the area where most of this contentious activity has been taking place recently. Thank you. Um, do you. Do you think that visits to Taiwan by senior US officials like Nancy Pelosi's trip uh, are productive or a liability in the US-China relationship? Well, I actually um, published an article with uh, a friend of mine, um, a uh, probably a few weeks before Nancy Pelosi's visit, and we we suggested that she should not go. Um, we said that the timing was was bad. Um, you might remember Nancy Pelosi was supposed to go to Taiwan in um, April. She got COVID, and then um, 
uh, the Chinese knew she would reschedule the trip. So they had an ample amount of time to prepare this massive display of military force. And as soon as she said she was going again, there was even one very well-known Chinese who is the editor, uh, former editor of uh, their, um, uh, their, it's like a, a, an offshoot of People's Daily, which is the Chinese Communist Party newspaper, but it's it's more sort of uh, for uh, the the public. It's a very it's sort of like a nationalist uh, um, paper. It's called Global Times, and and he said that if, if Nancy Pelosi tries to land on on Taiwan, uh, China's uh, it should China's military should shoot down her aircraft, um, and. Um, I don't think the U.S. really worried, but they did take some steps uh, to uh, try. Uh, when Pelosi came from South Korea, she took a very um, circuitous route so that she wouldn't be anywhere near the South China Sea where China has uh, fighter jets um, uh, operating. And the, the, really, the, the, uh, the point of this, um, um, from my perspective, is... Uh, is that, the, you know, the, the, the nationalism in China, it, it was so high that when Nancy Pelosi's uh, plane actually landed, there were a, about a million um, netizens in China who went online and started complaining, our leader is too soft, our government is too soft, we should have shot down her plane. And getting to the point where that's the kind of reaction that we are inciting in, in, in China, it's, it's bad for them and it's bad for us. So I really thought the timing of the trip was, was not a good idea. Um, but my view is um, uh, that uh, we should uh, try to avoid really poking a finger in China's eye in ways that um, we don't, we don't benefit. I mean, I, it's ultimately up to Taiwan. They get to decide whether somebody like a U.S. official should come or not. But the the, the ta Taiwanese officials, including the president, um, sometimes just can't say no. You know, it's like the U.S. offers to send somebody that's high level, and they're like, "Oh, this this will never it will never have the chance again. We have to say yes," and that's not a good position to be in. But you may have noticed that when um, uh, President Tsai transited the United States, she met with um, McCarthy. Um, and so, you know, uh, Representative McCarthy did not go to Taiwan. He wanted to go. But Taiwan pre had a wake up call after Pelosi's visit. And they decided, no, not a good idea if we host McCarthy. And so they really diplomatically organized it so that Tsai would meet with him and there would be photos and they'd have this press conference together, but it was done on US soil. And so my message is there are other ways to signal our support for Taiwan, that we care about Taiwan and have our senior uh, members of Congress interact with, um, with Taiwanese officials, including the president, but the way that we did this with Pelosi's visit, I just think was not not well executed. Okay, got that. Um, you mentioned the South China Sea. How big of a threat does China's claim of sovereignty in in the South China, China Sea pose? How how should the U.S. help this address this issue? Um. The United States does not take a position on who owns which land features in the South China Sea. And that's important. It's a consistent part of our policy. We don't say who owns what. Um, but we insist that this territorial dispute be addressed peacefully. And uh, the United States was a little bit asleep at the switch, in my view, when China decided to start dredging sand and militarizing these features. And now um, they have their um, military and Coast Guard ships operating 24 seven because they don't have to go all the way back to Hainan, um, which is right off the coast of uh, China. They can just operate in the South China Sea because they have bases there where they can replenish, uh, they can refuel, um, they can do maintenance. Um, and that has enabled them 
to be able to intimidate every single other claimant. Um, if they're out there exploring for oil or gas, or if they're fishing, um, the Chinese believe that because they have, they claim historical rights that in virtually all the South China Sea, that they have sovereignty. Um, and I think that the United States is right in challenging this, um, what we can consider to be um, an excessive maritime claim. And we do this by um, conducting freedom of navigation operations. Um, and we do this globally. It's not just in the South China Sea. We've had this program since the 1970s. Um, and, and I think it's important uh, that we protect the rights um, and as well as the obligations of all the countries that are um, um, members of the Convention on the Law of the Sea. And here I'll put in asterisks. The United States is not a member. We need to be um, because we basically um, abide by it, but we are not signatories and the Chinese are signatories, but they violate it. So it's really a bad match. Um, I think that we ought to be um, a signatory. Um, and, and so I think we're, we're pursuing uh, the right policies. Um, we, we should not side with any country, but we must insist that peace be, that, that, that uh, disputes be settled peacefully. We have a couple of speculative, hypothetical, political hypothetical questions. The worst kind. <laughs> Do with them what you want. <laughs> Can you speculate on policies that a possible second Trump administration might pursue with China? Oh, that's so difficult. Um, the most important Trump policy of his uh, four years in office was that he wanted to eliminate the bilateral trade deficit and everything else was subordinated to that. He didn't care about Taiwan. He didn't care about um, uh, about really about China's military. Um, all he wanted to do is eliminate the bilateral trade deficit. I don't know if that would change. Um, if Trump came in? Is that going to be his one singular thing he cares about? Or will it be something else? Um, he's already threatened to impose 60% tariffs on all goods coming in from China. Um, this is not particularly good for the United States, in my view. And it is interesting that all the tariffs that he has put in place are still there. Um, President Biden has not yet had the courage to decide which one of those, and there are some, are simply harmful to Americans and have no negative effect on China at all. Now, there are some of them that, oh, yes, absolutely should remain in place. So there is a plan. It might be done as early as next month, though uh, I don't know for sure, um, where the Biden administration might announce um, that they are tightening and increasing tariffs on some things like batteries, um, electric vehicles, uh, but removing or reducing tariffs and things like bicycles, where why do we care if we import bicycles uh, from China? It now costs Americans probably 50% more than it used to when they want to buy a bicycle from China. So um, I think um, my guess is that Trump will still care mostly about trade and that he will fall back once again on tariffs imposed on China. China. So I think we're going to all be sitting here saying, we've seen this movie before. I, I'd be really surprised if there's anything new. Okay. So this is possibly even more hypothetical. How would a Kamala Harris presidency change the relationship or affect the status quo with between US and China? That's an interesting question. Um, I've met Vice President Harris twice. Um, um, both times she was heading out to the region uh, to visit um, our allies. Um, and so she, uh, her team invited a few experts from outside the government uh, to have uh, give her some advice and, and, and talk about uh, some of the opportunities and challenges that the United States has uh, in the region. And um, She's she was very interested. Um, uh, I think she was um, uh, she was happier uh, to be traveling out to Asia rather than going down to to the border with Mexico <laughs> and dealing with the wall and immigration, which was really a lose lose issue from the get go. 
but um, I, you know, I don't know if she has very well formulated ideas about China, but my guess is that she would continue Biden administration policies in many ways, um, focusing on um, what the, the administration has a three word uh, uh, strategy with China, which they, they say is invest, align and compete. So it's invest in America, make ourselves strong, align with our allies so we work together with other countries because we really can't deal with China alone and use these two um, elements of invest and align to compete more effectively um, with, uh, with China. And, and my guess is th that she would essentially um, pursue a similar strategy. Right. Um... Do you share the view of some military experts that because this is an, a U.S. presidential election year, it would be the best time for China to take military action against Taiwan uh, and that the window is actually closing for their opportunities to recover Taiwan? I do not agree with that view. Um, we write, my co-authors and I write about this in, in the book um, that we that we published, which is very short. It's like 130 pages. You can read it in a few hours. It's intended as sort of like a policy book. It has three chapters um, and just a good history chapter. Um, and then there's a uh, an analysis of what happened in the Trump and Biden administrations in the U.S. Taiwan sort of China relationship. And then the last chapter is just um, uh, policy uh, recommendations. But we we address this issue of uh, of the 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 military has said some very unhelpful things uh, about uh, China. It it began with uh, Phil Davidson, our then commander of Indo Pacific Command who gave testimony in April of 2021. Um, and uh, he he went to Congress and, and he said that he believed that there could be a crisis in the Taiwan Strait um, uh, within the next six years. And then all of a sudden, 2027 became this code word. It was like, China's gonna attack by 2027. Um, and some people tried to roll this back, um, but uh, it, uh, it, it really caught on. And everybody referred to this as the Davidson window. And then we had um, General Minahan from the Air Force wrote, wrote an internal memo, which was leaked, um, which essentially said, you know, China could uh, invade any time. It might happen next year or um, at least by 2025. So, I, you know, there were all sorts of uh, years that were just uh, thrown out by uh, by people in the military. And finally, our uh, civilians in charge at the Pentagon uh, said a, a Chinese invasion of Taiwan is neither imminent nor inevitable. And that phrase uh, is now repeated by everyone, except um, now, you know, we have Admiral Paparo, who is just confirmed to be our next Indo-Pacific commander. Um, I, I sympathize with all these Indo-Pacific commanders because if they have to, if, if they are told to defend Taiwan, they don't have enough resources to do it. They don't have the weapons platform. It would be really massively difficult for the United States to defend Taiwan. And so what they're doing is they're really trying to ask for more resources. They're saying, you know, we don't know when a war is really going to happen. We do think China eventually might use force and we have to strengthen deterrence. So I understand why they're doing what they're doing. But I do think that in some ways it's very unhelpful. And my argument, um, I think it was last October, I had an op-ed in the, in the New York Times where I argued there were at least three things that were inducing caution in Xi Jinping's um, sort of cost benefit calculus as to whether he should invade uh, Taiwan. Um, one was the poor performance of Russia's uh, forces in Ukraine, uh, which has clearly demonstrated to China how difficult it would be for them to cross 100 miles of water um, and invade uh, Taiwan. This is the most difficult military um, operation um, and the Chinese, uh, P the PLA hasn't been to war um, since really 1979. So this is a huge risk. And if the PLA fails, that could um, end the legitimacy of Chinese Communist Party rule and Xi Jinping's personal position. This is way too risky. So I think the performance of Russian forces um, was one factor. Um, the second factor 
uh, was the uh, Chinese um, economy, um, which we've talked about why they're focused on their uh, uh, fixing their own economy, not uh, engaging in uh, in this adventure of taking over Taiwan. Taiwan isn't going anywhere. So it, it's not a crisis today. If it becomes a crisis at some point in the future, they better revitalize their economy first. And the third reason um, was um, the corruption in the PLA. And there's been a lot of uh, senior generals that have been removed uh, from their um, their positions in uh, the Chinese military. You know, if you're focused on lining your, your, your pockets, you're really not focused on your mission of preparing the PLA to go to war in case it has to. And I think that, that Xi Jinping is quite worried that his military is not very capable right now. So I think at least for those three reasons that Xi Jinping is just unlikely um, to see that it is, that there's urgency and that this window is is closing. Um, Taiwan is not going to declare independence anytime soon. Um, and Xi Jinping has a strategy to deal with Taiwan, which he actually inherited from his predecessor, Hu Jintao. He's using a lot more coercion against Taiwan, but he's also giving positive incentives. But the 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 strategy is essentially to prove to the people of Taiwan that they don't have a bright future unless they come back to the motherland. Um, and there's this disinformation that goes into Taiwan on a daily basis about how unreliable the United States is as a partner. And you can bet that when the Russians invaded Ukraine and the U.S. didn't put our forces on the ground in Ukraine, that the Chinese were, were telling, issuing this narrative to the people in Taiwan. They didn't come and rescue Ukraine. They didn't put themselves at risk. The United States is not going to come and defend you. And there is actually a significant number of people in Taiwan who, who don't believe that the United States would ever come and defend them. So the, the Chinese are trying to sow doubts and instill psychological despair in the, in the population in, in Taiwan. And it, it's, it's not such a bad strategy. I worry eventually over time, this could really erode the confidence of the people in Taiwan in their own government and their ability of their government to have a prosperous economy and provide them with good governance. Um, so I, I, I think um, you know Xi Jinping wants to win win the war without fighting, as Swinzi used to say. Well, let me. I, we have one final question. Uh, I think maybe you have partially answered this, but how likely, in your view, is armed conflict between China and the U.S. a possibility in the next fifteen years? Well, fifteen years is definitely a little bit harder. Um, I don't think that it's likely at, at all. Let's say within the next maybe three to five. Um, so Xi Jinping is, what, 70 now, 15 years, and certainly 85. He could still be leader of China. One really interesting question is, is unification um, a legacy issue for him? I've argued against that. I don't think it is. I think preventing Taiwan independence um, is essential. I think he wants to put Taiwan and China on a, on a trajectory of maybe moving a little bit more together rather than apart. Um, that would be difficult enough to achieve. Um, and he wants to, um, uh, to prevent the United States from supporting any trend toward independence in Taiwan. But 15 years is a very, very long time. Um, and at that point, let's see, 2024, 34, 39. So we would be um, we would be one decade away from the target date of achieving national rejuvenation that Xi Jinping has set. So it could become more urgent then um, if Xi Jinping is in power and he decides it has to be done now. My biggest concern is Xi Jinping himself. So if he has the, the military capabilities, if he believes that the United States won't come to Taiwan's defense, um, if the United States is not as committed to preserving peace and stability in the Indo-Pacific, 
Um, maybe we're distracted elsewhere, um, or maybe we've decided that we don't need to have bases anymore in Japan and South Korea, for example. Then we could create a circumstance in which Xi Jinping concludes that the risk is, um, is uh, tolerable uh, of taking a chance of going after Taiwan with, uh, with military force. And he could create a blockade uh, around Taiwan and try to squeeze it uh, to death. Uh, so obviously there are different ways in which he could use uh, pressure on, on Taiwan. So um, I, I think I'm, I'm more worried uh, if the United States is not strong and we are not present in the region, we don't have strong alliances, um, then the chances of, of Xi Jinping using military force, I think, go up. Okay. Well, it is almost 8.30, so, and we've had quite a um, extensive Q&A period. Thank you to everybody for posting their questions and thank you for your very informative answers, Bonnie. And with that, we can say good night. Good night, everyone. Take care.